that's the learning, learning company in Sengi's work. So it seems to me that the, the one difference with his, his approach is the systems aspect. Whereas at yeah. Lancaster, the, 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 Ch- Chapman did a lot of work at a certain for sure, sort of time. For sure. But it was, it was seen, some of the management learning and management science were different, different bits of the discussion. Well, yes, I, I, I think they were. Um, our ne- neighbor department, which was a department of behavior and organization, is, is now a department of organization, work and technology. So they were on to it. But I, I mean, I think we were. I think, I think you're right in saying that um, Senga fifth discipline model has all kinds of aspects to it, but the integrating core is systems theory. Uh, <clears throat> but I think you could say the same of, of some of the learning company, um, because I, <clears throat> we have well, we, we have two ways of describing it, presenting it. One is the eleven characteristics, um, and they are a mixture of the hard and the soft, the scientific and the human relations. Uh, so there's accounting systems and the like, uh, but also self-development for all, so that, like TQM, which in many ways it is a successor to or development of. Um, uh, <coughs> that seems to work. But the other um, way we are describing is what we call the e-flow model, <coughs> which is um, four interacting circles, two figure eights, if you like. Uh, <coughs> so it's a bit like the cold learning cycle, which I'm sure you're familiar with. <coughs> um, so in no particular well actually starting with cold the bottom horizontal figure 8 is the cold learning cycle twisted, if you imagine twisting a rubber band from a circle into a figure 8 you have um, um, and we, we call it like thought and action or something like that so th- you think what to do, you do it you see what happens, you modify it <coughs> and on the top of that um, is another figure 8 which is the same cold process, um, <clears throat> but for the organisation as a whole, and we call it policy and operations, and that means policy, not in the rule book sense, but more in the overall aim objective. We might use the word strategy, uh, and operations are the same. So the organisation makes a strategic choice, puts it into practice, see what happens, and revises the, um, the strategy uh, accordingly. And if so a stronger learning organisation if they have a new idea rather than bang it out as a universal policy like the health service did for example when it said every patient should have a named nurse rolled it out and it somehow didn't work and it faded away but I think it was uh, B&Q a number of years ago in an era of labour shortage thought let's try older people <coughs> but they thought well let's try that out in half a dozen of our um, branches uh, so, they, so they tried it um, they, they found it it worked that um, older people could do the jobs but even as you often do with learning you get one or two surprises one of which was pilferage went down <coughs> and, that, and there were two theories about that why that one is that older people like you and me well not strong enough to lug the stuff away <laughs> and the other is that perhaps we come from a more honest or honest generation you pay your money and takes your choice. <coughs> but having spotted that, they then put older people in roles like you know, head of stores or something like that. So that, that's how that works. <coughs> and then there's a linkage, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So individual learning is not constrained. So on the right hand side, operations and action, uh, people, people's actions are constrained by the operational plan and the boundaries of their job description, which can be very tight or very loose, Uh, but ultimately it's um, it's constrained, it's just a matter of degree. Uh, um, And on the left hand side that would be individual thought, ideas and collective policy or strategy. Now many or most organisations brief down their mission vision statement, Uh, um, but what they tend to do less is listen to feedback on it. Some do and some don't, but I think more don't than do. So I think um, back in the days of Jackie Rover or Leyland, whoever it was, Graham Day 
hired the National Exhibition Centre and assembled the troops and Rover, Leyland, Jaguar, whoever they were then, and sort of intoned the mission statement, you know, out of a cloud of artificial smoke, or background music or something like that. But of course you don't get much feedback from the employees doing that, and the employees may laugh and joke about it in the pub afterwards, but it may or may not filter back to management. So there's usually a blockage on the way up. Um, there was a uh, uh, grassroots um, focus groups in the BBC at one stage. <coughs> At the grassroots level, they came up with some quite serious problems, bullying, for example. Um, but the report got um, modified and um, cleansed, if you like, as it, as it went up the organisation. So when you got to the controllers, I think, which is what they call the equivalent of a board of directors in the BBC, if the message was, well, things are pretty good but the chips are a bit soggy in the canteen, that kind of thing. Uh, but the serious stuff had got sort of filtered out. I mean, perhaps people didn't want to, the career limiting to pass up bad news or, or, or for whatever reason. Um, um, and similarly, operations managers may tell employees what to do. They may or may not listen, though probably it's to their advantage to find out what's gone wrong. <coughs> um, and some problems can be fixed at operational level without tinkering with the strategy or policy. Uh, but others may throw up something more serious that can be done with that, in which case it has to rush it back to a revision of policy and strategy, which is a neat way of talking about single and double loop learning, if you recall that from sure. Artris and Sean and the yeah. like. So it's the difference between changing the kind of operational procedures, and if that fixes it, fair enough. But if it doesn't, um, You've got to sort of change the rules of the game rather than the way you play it. Yes. You want to try and do better things rather than do things better, depending on how you want to put it. Uh, <coughs> now, the learning organisation model, and perhaps others, um, in terms of a distinction, a helpful distinction, I think, made by Peter Senge, he talks about three levels the, um, the reactive, the adaptive, and the generative. generative. So, the reactive organisation works on the kind of basis if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Which often works quite well. The trouble is, as with your car, if it's in the, if, if you don't fix it before it's broken, it may broke, break more seriously and more expensively. So it pays to do preventative um, maintenance. So the adaptive organisation, and that's probably where 80 or 90% of organisations are, uh, and the, uh, 80 or 90% of strategy literature says you read the environment, forecast how it's going to change and position yourself to take advantage of it, um, <coughs> which is quite a Darwinian adapt to the environment. Uh, but Peter Zeng says the level above that, which he calls generative, is that you adapt the environment to suit you, to, in your own interest. Uh, <coughs> um, so, for example, um, uh, um, a called Peter Binns was in the philosophy department at Cambridge wrote a chapter in one of our books that when an amoeba is faced with a shortage of water it shrivels up into a little lump of jelly and if the water comes back in time it can rehydrate into a happy little amoeba but if it doesn't it's you know, literally dust whereas what do human beings do faced with a shortage of water well uh, what we do uh, we would uh, build a reservoir Correct, correct. Yeah, we adapt the environment to suit us. The wrong answer is buy the bottles from Waitrose. <laughs> uh, except if you live in Chelsea, perhaps. Uh, but yes, we, we build dams, we dig wells, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, we adapt the environment to us. And that's what the learning organisation does. So, um, game changes. I don't know whether they do it knowingly or deliberately, but if you remember, and you still see the adverts on the, on the television, um, was it direct line insurance? Yes. Um, but, uh, this was pre-web. Um, but what they did was shift selling insurance from, again, you know, chaps in Cortinas, like my Lego example, and branch offices in most towns and cities, uh, <coughs> um, to doing away with the offices and the Travelling salespeople, um, 
and initially it was a, tele it was a call in telephone service and they pass on a significant proportion of the savings to the customers so it's a virtuous circle and sell cheaper insurance, do more business, expand that and you'll notice that most traditional insurance companies have opened their online uh, services in parallel with that um, or as go compare etc etc and of course it's you can still do it on the phone but it's shifted substantially to the web as well um, so it fits with that progression of, of virtualization um, I forgot what that was in what the question was that generated all that oh generative I was yeah, so elaborating and this is to do with uh, where the learning organisation or learning company might, might go next uh, so I think um, although you can tweak the eFlow model that I described there in the 